So I think just to start it off, it makes sense to talk about what we're talking about when we say cloud computing. Um, so if the panel wouldn't mind um, giving us kind of what you think cloud computing means. I'd say the way that I would think of the cloud if I, if I was in your shoes is just the way that the world works now with the internet and technology. I mean, if you have your phone, you have everything. Um, I was talking to some of, my, some of the guys I graduated school with and I said, what would we have done at bars if we couldn't argue over facts that we couldn't actually find the right answer to? I mean, that's what half of our time was. It was like, no, no, he had a terrible year in 1986 or, or whatever the case was. Um, and now you can just get the answers to all of that. And I think where it becomes kind of interesting is that a lot of those things where it's just a fact, you need to get that fact, or if it's a repetitive um, application of some sort, those things can be automated and it frees people and resources up to go do other things. And I think that's where it becomes really interesting. So if you don't have to spend your time memorizing X amount of facts and you can then say, okay, now that I have that as an asset and I can then build on top of it without having to put the same amount of time and effort into it, again, I think that's where uh, a lot of the innovation can come from is uh, moving up that stack. Starting with that is, you know, a lot of it is about off-premise, whether it's off your own premise, like you're not running your, you know, your own um, word processor anymore on your home computer, but you're running Google Apps, Google Docs, um, or you're an enterprise and you're not running your own data center anymore. Um, instead, you're outsourcing that um, infrastructure to a, a cloud provider like Amazon or, or you know, any of the other folks here on the panel. Um, the in a way, it goes all the way back to the 60s of, of time sharing that, that Dartmouth innovated. And we have all the infrastructure now and the technology where that's a realistic uh, model again, where it simplifies both the consumer's life and um, a technologist's life to be able to outsource all the, the muck, if you will, of you know, managing an OS install, you know, keeping your data center costs as low as possible, keeping the databases backed up. You know, there's a there's a, a broad range, and that's that's where cloud gets kind of confusing because it means so many different things. But at the end of the day, it's it's simplifying technology, cutting the costs, letting the experts take care of managing all the muck, so that as a business or as a consumer, you can get on with your life. And the one aspect I'll throw into that is is there's definitely a public access and, and a, you know off premise access and a network aspect to the cloud. But for any decently sized company, right, where there are concerns that may still exist today of data privacy, security, whatever, the cloud concepts are often also applied in terms of private clouds. And so you'll hear the term private cloud versus a public cloud and a hybrid cloud, which will have some public and private elements. And that's a really important part when an enterprise is looking at taking advantage of the cloud because you're not going to be able to throw anything that an enterprise does, at least today, out in a public cloud and off-premise. So you can bring those cloud concepts into what you do in-house too, and that's a big part of the, the value prop in the play. And I want to drill down onto just this point because I know that um, different companies that are bringing cloud services to the market have different points of view on this, as do consumers of the cloud. Um, can, we, can we talk a little bit about the pros and cons of the public cloud approach versus the private cloud approach? Well, one of the things that we've seen with the Amazon Web Services um, adoption is a lot, of the, a lot of the early adopters have either been startups or they've been new projects within enterprises where they have been maybe on the fringe, maybe on a Skunk Works project. Those are, those are typically the the, the easiest um, to sell, if you will, on, on the cloud. I think at the other end of the spectrum, you get into some of the, you know, the, the most valuable data assets, whether it's uh, accounting information or you know, payment card information that enterprises ultimately will be um, more reticent to think about outsourcing control of that to, uh, to a third party provider. And that's where the, you get into these hybrid clouds where you can you can bind together your local IT assets um, with a cloud provider and be able to run a hybrid where the assets you're comfortable outsourcing to a third party provider run there and then the ones you want to keep close can can stay close. Mm -hmm. I'd say that we've seen the a bit of a switch where cost was definitely the leading factor. Um, we launched Google Apps in I think it was 2007. Uh, for businesses, and at first, that's what really broke it open for us. Is you know, unfortunately, the economy has kind of taken a downturn, and it made people take this more seriously. Like, okay, I wasn't really going to go into the cloud area, but if I can really save that much money, I have to take a look at it. But I think the innovation is really starting to pick up now. I mean, think of a university environment. I mean, I'm presuming if you don't already, most universities are probably looking to have mobile apps for just about everything. You know, you're adding, dropping courses, and so forth. And can you imagine the load? 
during that two-week period at the beginning of every semester. And if you had to build the infrastructure to be able to handle peak capacity of that on your own, it, there's no way it would ever happen. And that's happened um, personally for me in, in the business life where we have Google Sites, which is kind of like a wiki, SharePoint-ish, portal-ish type of thing. Um, I, want, I was working with third parties who were doing reselling for us, and I was able to, by myself, build a site that was a secure portal for them to access information or I could give them training and you know, all sorts of different uh, collateral and documentation. And before the cloud, I would have gone into IT. The first thing they would ask is, how long is this project? How much budget do you have? And you know, gone through that whole project. And I would say, screw it, I'll just email them attachments. And you know, they would have had out-of-date information five seconds after I sent it. But I think that's where it gets really interesting is where you can, again, move to not only doing things more cost effectively, but doing things that you couldn't do before. Yeah, I agree. And I, I would label that business agility, basically. And, and in the enterprise space, certainly cost is always a factor. I mean, there's never a, a decision that's not uh, looked at from an economic perspective. But the business agility and the ability to move quickly, be it even a simple example um, in terms of going to IT or literally a large project where you've got the ability to move at a pace you never could before. You don't need to size up the, uh, the architecture perhaps that you might have in the past or deploy uh, equipment that might take you 60 days, 90 days, longer than that. The ability to move at a pace far faster than that and business moves at a pace faster than that. So in order to be competitive, that becomes a differentiator. Uh, the other thing is, I would say, the ability for a business to focus on its core competency and not have to focus on running an infrastructure. And we see less and less companies with the tolerance to invest resources a across what's not their differentiated advantage. And I think that's an opportunity, quite frankly, for all service providers, regardless if they're private cloud providers, hybrid uh, public cloud, the biggest competitor out there is actually the IT departments and companies that are doing it themselves. And for years, that was an area that kind of propagated itself. And I think what we're seeing is a, is a fundamental shift in the way businesses think about IT from having to build it and do it all yourself, run your own data center, build every app, roll out every server to one where they can buy that. And they can buy that probably in a, in a fashion that's better than they were able to do it themselves and apply their resources towards their core business and really apply their capital, their resources to differentiate what it is that they do as a business. And with great power of cloud comes great responsibility. And, and it's very easy to uh, make the end runs that you described, but that's not effective for a business. At the end of the day, that, that IT group has a critical responsibility if the business is going to be successful to insert itself in a way that doesn't hinder the business, but enables the business to leverage the cloud, enables the business to understand why a firewall is needed and not necessarily be experts in firewalls, but know how to ensure the proper security and audit criteria are in place, for example. Uh, the right protections are there for critical, sensitive, proprietary corporate data, for example. And that's something that's got to be propagated across the enterprise. That becomes a more serious challenge as every application becomes more and more mobilized across uh, many, many different types of devices, be they tablets, be they smartphones, uh, be they PCs. And so the, the challenge of IT, I think, actually uh, is, is stepped up in a cloud world. And we need to see a transformation of the leaders in that space from ones who would look at cloud as a threat and fight the adoption that inevitably will happen to one that's an enabler, but understand how their role needs to really adapt in order to make the business successful in the cloud. Anytime I'm at any kind of conference or a panel or something and you have a, a business uh, and they'll ask them, you know, are you using cloud? And they say, oh, we're not really using cloud in our enterprise. And just, of course you are. You just don't know that you're using cloud in your enterprise. And, right. Yeah, they're the ones that have a problem. They probably have accounts with, uh, with these two gentlemen <laughs> and they don't realize it. You have to look at this from all sides as you're doing it, and IT can't throw up the FUD that they were five years ago and saying we can't do this because of all these reasons that the business people won't understand. Business people can't just go in and start doing it and saying like, uh, you know, forget IT, I'm not going to ask them, I'm just going to do it on my own. They, they all have to work together, and I think that organizationally it's pretty important to take this head on because it's going to happen whether you want to or not, right? So I'll throw out kind of a comparison and I'm curious to see whether or not you think it's a valid comparison or one that's just totally overreaching. The comparison is, you know, if you think about sort of the late 90s into the early part of the aughts, if we can call them that, um, you know, there was a fundamental shift, particularly in media, because it no longer was important to own a printing press. 
right? And all of a sudden you can throw things up online and then you have blogs, now you have Twitter. It's a whole bunch of ways that sort of democratize the production of content. So, so arguably, the introduction of cloud is doing that for app developers. All of a sudden you no longer have all of these barriers to entry that you previously needed, needed to obtain in order to you know, ship software or do whatever it is that you wanted to do. Do you see this as being a valid comparison? Do you, do you see the, the shift as, as being that um, kind of extreme? And if so, kind of at what stage do you think we are in that shift that's enabled by this cloud uh, platform? Well, I think the cloud certainly enables some of the innovation that you, you're talking about for app developers. I'm not sure I'd, I'd equate it to the same uh, 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 example that you gave. But for example, um, while just about anyone, two guys in a garage, can write an app these days, um, you know, is that enabled by cloud? Is that enabled by mobile devices? Or is that enabled by some combination? And even despite who it's enabled by, how does something like that really take shape? How does that really get legs, per se? I still think that it requires um, a, a distribution mechanism to customers. Apple has done some of that with its, with its store for consumers, for example, Google, et cetera. Um, but also support mechanisms, ultimately, for that to get adopted into business, for example. Who's going to sell it to those businesses? Who's going to support it for those businesses? You know, do those products ultimately need to get owners that have uh, reach into, uh, into a corporation? Or is there some kind of uh, mediator? That they, can, that they can play with, a broker, if you will, that will enable kind of a SaaS marketplace for business. I think that still remains to be seen. I would say it's a pretty apt comparison. Um, and I think the cloud can help with distribution as well in, in terms of those marketplaces. I, I agree that where it stands right now is a bit Darwinian in terms of people want to put the effort into figuring out what everything's all about. They can, but you don't get the same kind of services if you're getting your local Oracle rep to show up and you know take you through the whole spiel. So it, it definitely favors the people who are comfortable and, and willing to dive in. Um, but I, and I think this is something that's going across all industries, and all industries are seeing it different flavors. I had um, the board of directors from a university come visit not too long ago, and they asked me if I thought my degree would be worth less to me if all the classes I took were available on YouTube. And I said no, because if I could have got the same amount out of just watching the YouTube video, then I shouldn't have been paying however much money I paid for to attend the university. It's also the relationships, the networks, the, ex ex the experiential you know, classes. That's what I took the most away from. And so I think education is shifting. I think technology is shifting a lot of different things. Um, I've, I've talked about this a couple times today, but if you look at just the, the decrease in GDP starting in 2008 and then it rebounded back to the point where it's where it was, but jobs haven't come back. That's because people found ways to be more efficient with technology. Not saying it's a good thing, I'm not happy about fewer jobs, but I'm saying that we need to embrace this and recognize that technology can help us do more things. Let's figure out how to get the most out of it because this is a steam train that's coming right through us. I agree with Steve, though. I think it's that, that analogy to the printing press and stuff is more just technology in general. It's really, you know, the internet is probably what that analogy is more closely tied to, and, and the concepts of cloud and, you know, the acceleration of mobile and what's that's doing, you know, in terms of sort of getting the cloud out into the hands of people is just, you know, further evolution of what really started with, you know, the key concepts of the internet years ago. Yeah. And, and we're, between mobile and, um, and mobile apps being, able, you know, there's, there's plenty of examples of mobile app developers plus developers building um, websites and other technologies today on the internet, on the cloud, on uh, these me distribution mechanisms like, like um, you know, these mobile app stores that obviously you couldn't have done prior to the, I mean, the, the internet is clearly the, the, the key enabler, to your point. Um, and we've got countless examples of startups that have created meaningful businesses on a shoestring that they wouldn't have been able to do before. I had a question around competition, uh, specifically for the infrastructure. So as I think about cloud, I would argue that partially you're giving some buyer power back to the customer, right? Because they're not locked in buying all these servers, all this basically CapEx. Um, how do you go about thinking about building customer stickiness? And by that, I mean getting people, now that they do have this flexibility to stay with your service and not falling into some type of commodity trap where you're competing on price. Like, how do you guys go about thinking about differentiating yourselves and really kind of building that customer loyalty when we talk about cloud? I think the way we think about it, price is certainly a component and 
something that is in our DNA, being able to, to run at the lowest cost possible because you know, historically we are a retail business with thin margins. But to your point, that's probably not the only dimension that you want, ideally you want, you want to use to compete. Um, so another sort of core element of our retail philosophy is selection. So a selection within any particular offering, like an EC2, we have a broad selection of different instance types, whether you want you know, a micro-sized instance for a few cents an hour to um, instances that you can string together and build supercompute clusters from. Um, and then selection across the offering. So having, having these infrastructure building blocks that you can use from compute to messaging to storage to um, you know, CDN, content delivery network type um, technologies. Having, having all those components not only available, but also work together well in a, in a unified offering. And I think the last part is, is trust. You know, building the trust, delivering on that trust, and delivering consistently both in terms of performance as well as an innovation. So having kind of a, a steady pace of continuing to you know, increase the functionality of the offering, expanding to, to new offerings, and all the while driving down the price. I space, I would answer that in terms of, I don't view myself as selling infrastructure. I view myself as selling solutions and dragging along that infrastructure as part of those solutions and building those at a customer level or at a vertical level that are adding value to the customer. So for example, uh, one, one use case we've developed is medical imaging in the cloud, in the healthcare space. That pulls along a lot of infrastructure. There's nothing that uses probably more storage than you know, x-rays and MRIs. But we don't sell that as infrastructure. We sell that as a solution to our healthcare customers. And we come at that in a whole different space, often with things like professional services wrapped around that. So it differentiates the, the service such that you're not having a commodity infrastructure discussion. You're having a, a solution discussion. And then I think to the point that Peter made around trust, a lot of that comes from being able to deliver time and time again, reliability. You know, we call it carrier grade at AT&T at because that's what people have come to expect, that we'll keep the lights green and we'll continue to deliver their projects on time and make sure that we deliver quality service. That's how you establish and continue to build on that trust. I was going to have the same answer as Steve, essentially. It's, you know, there's people that would know how to use just a very basic commodity cloud, right? They're smart enough, they know how to use it, they know how to leverage it. Um, but then there's lots of enterprises, right, where they don't want to know how to use a cloud, right? It's cool that they use a cloud, they know it's cost efficiency, but they don't even want to have technology skills, right, because that's not really what they're trying to do. So it's having the support and the services and basically, you know, we won't only sell you the cloud, we'll, we'll help you use the cloud. Well, I think we've run through our time, so I hope you'll join me in thanking the panelists because I thought it was a great discussion.